speaking to system at 800 hours. The attendance mm -hmm. covering this evening is being conducted in Rob Norwood. Tomorrow morning will be Margaret Hope. I found this on the web. All right, Derlin, what do you think? Well, we've got ourselves. <laughs> Good new people. 601. 601, let's kick this off. There's John Adams, he just joined. Okay, good, yeah. Well, Bill and I had discussed on Friday that he was going to sort of lead and facilitate the discussion. Uh, we had put together, as, as a lot of people probably saw on the, the website, we put together Mike Bender's questions and answers. So I hope we, people got a chance to, to review those. And uh, so I think, Bill, why don't I just turn it over to you and let's see where we go. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for asking me to be facilitator for this meeting. And I wanna just uh, take a bow to Kyle Avila there who's doing the stuff that I absolutely don't know how to do on these Zoom meetings. Uh, I had prepared some remarks, depending on how many people were here. I think uh, if I'm looking at it, it doesn't appear as though there's very many people. So I don't think I need to say a number of the things I was gonna say. Um, I did talk to Mike earlier and uh, alerted him that I was gonna ask him to sort of kick us off by providing us with a, a brief overview uh, based in part on the, on the project itself or the engineering study that's proposed and also supplemented by the kinds of questions that he's been getting from people. So uh, Mike, if you're prepared, then uh, I'd invite you to start us off and we can then proceed to take questions and, and get comments. Sure thing. Um, thanks, Bill. So. Uh, I, I guess I got to echo Bill's comments about seeing who's attended. It looks like everybody that is here is probably familiar with uh, what we've been talking about for the last year and a half. Um, I'd be happy to do an overview again if you want, but I don't want to waste everybody's time and rehashing everything we've been discussing for the last uh, few months. Well, Mike, okay, I think... <laughs> yeah. I think you've answered, you know, I think I, I've been reading what you wrote on the questions that you posted on the on the, <clears throat> the website here. And um, I think you've been very thorough about it. I just have one question and, and question one is why don't we just build living quarters in Stonesville to Seal Harbor? Why a new building? I think the question was really about why can't you provide just living quarters like take the condominium that could be for sale across the street from the firehouse, which would be living quarters. Because I understand that there's very difficult and, and strategic things you have to do in order to build on the building you've got now that you have to satisfy HIPAA and all these kind of things uh, that you wouldn't have to if you just had living quarters in, a, in another house or something close to the firehouse. Sure. Um, Bill, you just want me to jump right into these? Yes. Yeah. Well, I think what I'm going to do is, if uh, given the size of the group we have right now, when John asks a question like that, you should feel free to respond. And if we get to be a larger number, then I'll try to step in and control the discussion a little bit more. Okay. Fair enough. And, you know, again, I guess if, if anybody wants me to do a brief overview of how we got here, I'd be, feel, I'd be happy to do that for, for anybody. Um, John, that, that scenario is really not, has, is not done in the fire service and there's, there's a number of reasons. Um, primarily, 
time counts when you respond to emergencies, whether it's an EMS or a fire call or even police, but we're not talking about, you know, law enforcement now, but so you want to have your, your staff, your um, responders very close to your equipment as close as you can, because you want to cut down not only minutes, but seconds in, in responding. And how's your duty crew outside the fire station, you know, logistically, it can make it a little bit more difficult to respond in a timely manner. Um, you know, well, what if what if it's that close? What if it's right across the street from the from the town office right now? Well, you still have to you'd have to get out of there and make your way to the fire station, you know, so you're talking about walking over or driving over or whatever. Um, and in the wintertime, you know, that can be a little bit more challenging because of the snow and the conditions and, and things like that. Um, and I'm, you know, believe me, I'm familiar with this because I've been responding to fire calls at nighttime for 35 years. And, you know, it, it takes a lot of time to get out of bed, get out to your car, scrape off six inches of snow. Um, if you're plowed in, you got to shovel your way out and get down to the fire station. Now, if you want to walk over, you know, from there, that can probably be done. But you're still adding, you know, probably a couple minutes of, of running over to the fire station. Um, you know, and if if that worked, the fire service would, would have done that a long time ago. You'd see that type of situation um, elsewhere in the country. And you just don't see that much because it just, um, just well, to be honest with you, it just doesn't make sense. You, know, you, want your just, staff, you want your staff next to your fire trucks. Next well, to I, agree, I agree to part of that, but I'm just trying to find a way to save a huge amount of money here. I mean, we're, we're talking about two and a half million dollars to provide living quarters. And we're talking about God knows what it's gonna be in Sonesville in that building. So I'm looking to try to be physically responsible as a citizen um, because I'm also a taxpayer. So, you know, and I've, I've owned my own businesses for 40 years and I'm trying to look at a, at a common sense, if we can do a common sense approach to this. And the things I see in here, like adding a, a fire boat just don't make sense to me. We, the harbor master is right down there. We have the harbor master's boat right down there, and a fire boat that goes where? I mean, Cranberry Island, which is not the town of Mount Desert. I mean, where would you go with a fire boat? Okay, um, I thank you, John, for your your comments and and pointing out these things. I also want to give an opportunity if there's anyone else who's present here that has a question that they want to ask as well. Sure. Yes. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else that wishes to ask Chief Bender or make a comment as John has so ably done? I, I have a yes, question that sort of might seem a little off topic, but you know, I think whether we like it or not, the, the proposed project for Northeast Harbor and what occurs in Solmesville, they are linked to a certain degree. And, and this might be a bit of a remedial question, but we hear about the water situation in Somesville, and I've never had someone clearly explain what the actual situation is with getting water to that building. I was just wondering, could you just quickly explain that, Mike, and then how has it worked thus far, and, and how would you see that working sort of down the road if there were living quarters or something like that at it in Somesville? Sure. Um... I've been told that when that building was built in 1980, 81, I think, uh, somewhere in there, uh, there was a well drilled, uh, the water was tested, and it was deemed uh, non-potable um, due to a, um, a mill. I, apparently, there used to be a sawmill there, and the groundwater is, is contaminated. <clears throat> um, and it's contaminated with, um, ta ta I, can't, I can't think of the chemical now. Um, so... They elected to run a line from the Masonic Hall. And when I say they, I'm talking about the Solnesville Fire Company, which existed back then and built that building, um, free of charge to the town, by the way. Um, and so they, they elected to pipe water in from the Masonic Hall. Um, so right now, the water is uh, coming from the Masonic Hall across the street. <clears throat> um, it's suitable now because the building is not you know, lived in. So the only time when you really need water is when you're flushing the toilets, washing the trucks. Um, occasionally, there's function going on in the in the uh, community room. You need to use the sink, um, but it's not 100% reliable. We found that you know when you have power outages and the generator doesn't start over in Masonic Hall, we don't have any water. 
Um, and that, you know, that we hadn't caused us any difficulties yet, but it can be an issue. I mean, you know, I can imagine returning from the fire and not having any water to clean your trucks or equipment or, or even wash your hands, you know. Um, so I, I think, you know, if we pursue this uh, Sonsal reno renovation, we're gonna have to solve this water problem. Now I have, I haven't looked into it fully yet, but I believe, now I don't know if this was the case back in 80, 81 when the building was built, but I believe there is um, uh, treatment available for the water now um, with that chemical in there to make it usable. Um, but obviously we're gonna have to pursue that a little bit more in depth and, and um, you know, try to solve that issue. Perfect, thanks. Thank you, Matt, thank you. Another question or comment? So there's no town water that goes by the building, right? No, there's not. That's what I, yeah, somebody asked me that today. So now I know the answer. Yeah, yeah. If there was, if there was, we'd have hydrants up there. <laughs> yeah. Mike, can you go back to John Adams' question regarding the boats? Because I think that, I don't think that was answered. Sure. Um, so we have a boat right now. It's a little uh, eight foot logic boat. It was bought by the Sonzo company probably uh, 25 years ago. Um, and the, uh, the intent of that boat was to ferry firefighters and equipment over to Rum Island on Long Pond in case there was a wildland fire over there. Um, but it was also purchased small enough and light enough so uh, responders could use it during ice rescue, um, primarily dragging it across the ice using it as a sled. Um, we have since then um, been involved in marine type of rescues in and around the area. Um, what we're finding, especially since 9-11, is the Coast Guard, which has been somewhat reliable for, for rescues and um, boat fires too, um, are, are more involved in homeland security now. So their availableness, if that's the word, is, is uh, somewhat questionable because they're, um, they're, they're out of station more and more doing homeland secu uh, security duties. So we thought it would be time to purchase a boat that was actually seaworthy, I guess, if, um, you know, I'll, I'll go that way. Um, but I also have some great concerns about the marina down here. Um, the harbor master boat does not have any fire suppression capabilities on it whatsoever. And um, with the amount of boat traffic you have down here and the amount of vessels you have in here during the summertime, you know, um, it wouldn't be, um, um, well, it, it, my concerns are is having a boat fire down here and then just going from one boat to another boat to another boat um, without us having any of the tools to, to try to fight a fire. So the boat that we were looking to purchase was gonna fill a dual role and be used for water rescues um, if we should need to use that in and around the waters of, uh, of the Mount Desert Island. Um, we also would make it available to the ambulance service because there are times where um, the ambulance service is requested to go to Cranberry Isle um, or either, well, let me go back a little ways. Um, the ambulance service is either requested to send a paramedic out to the island um, or there have been times where um, there may have been requests to, to send additional crews out there or bring a patient back. Um, so that's the reason why we wanted to purchase a, a, a rescue boat. Uh, we haven't made that purchase yet, and we're still in the, the uh, specification process, I, I, I guess, if you will, of that. Can't but, you put fire suppression things that you need on the Harbor Master's boat? Um, not that would be effective. I mean, we can always... You're kind of using a garden hose on a on a structure fire, um, that type of scenario with that. So the other thing too is the harbor master I found in the past is uh, not always always available. There's not somebody down there that can run that boat 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, we have been called when nobody's available to run the harbor master's boat down there. So it's not 100% reliable um, to use all the time. Or be so what kind of marine rescue things have you ha had to do? I can't hear you. Yep, I'm not hearing him either. Oh, sorry, I get muted. Yep. Um, <clears throat> a number of them are in the long pond um, in the freshwater, but we have had calls for uh, to go to Bar Harbor for mutual aid, uh, for kayaks overturned, um, 
You mean to respond to Bar Harbor's problem? Well, it's a mutual aid job. You know, when they need help, we go over and help them. When we need help, they come over and help us. It's, it's do they have a boat? They do not. Well, the fire department does not have a boat, no. But is there a boat, a boat available? The police, Bar Harbor? Have, the police department has a boat over there. So that should be able to take care of Bar Harbor then. Well, I can't speak for Bar Harbor. <laughs> I'm just saying that when they ask us for help, we respond with the staff and equipment they're requesting. So in terms of this engineering study that's on Article 24, Mike, is the, uh, uh, it, the potential that one of the bays would be used for a boat or is the boat sort of tangential to this engineering study itself? Um, no, the boat has nothing to do with engineering study. The boat has nothing to do with the design of the fire station. We're not adding any bays or not adding any room for a boat. Okay. Well, you say right in there that you are. You know, it's, and if it's not used for a boat, maybe a tank truck you're going to bring over from time to time. And if you're not using for that, then you're going to use it to park the, your, your, your truck in the building. Right? That's what you answered with. Right. Well, we're going to store the boat or our trucks inside the truck base. Yes. Does the police department have bays that they can park in in the winter? Um, the Mount Desert Police? Yep. They have one, what we call a sally port. Are there other uh, questions? For Mike, with respect to the engineering study here, or Article uh, 24. Well, I just mine is just a general question in in okay. that, um, but it's related to all of this. In in, oh, I just thought, I just lost it. Excuse me. Okay. <laughs> well, just let me know, and then because we'll go right back to you. But in the meantime, if anyone else has a yeah, I'd like to have some questions from other people. No. Doesn't seem to be though. Did I ask if there's anybody here that is involved uh, uh, either with the fire department or uh, EMS and all that uh, would like to comment from their perspective as to what uh, this kind of a project might offer? I can throw something in, Bill, if you want. Okay, Basil, thank you. Um, yeah, um, so with the kind of the, the dual approach to having uh, staffing in Soamsville and Northeast Harbor, um, a lot of that was brought about um, by the fact that the ambulance service actually has a large number of calls in the Soamsville area. And um, kind of through the years, we've realized that responding to life-threatening emergencies from Northeast Harbor is it's a long ways to go. I mean, when we're going to Sonesville or Hall Quarry or Pretty Marsh, um, and there's times where it can be in, you know, upwards of almost 20 minutes to get there. And that's, you know, a long time to wait if you really need help. Um, and so that was really one of the big reasons why, um, you know, Mike and I talked and Chief Willis and Derlin about splitting this up and not putting all our eggs in one basket here in Northeast Harbor and, you know, doing something in both communities and, I really think this has the potential to uh, really increase the abilities of the fire department and EMS and offer a lot to the community by doing this. So I definitely recognize that there's a large cost that goes along with this, but hopefully the improvement in service will be worth the cost that um, it will take to do it. So. Thank you, Basil. Yeah, no problem. I would tend to agree with that wholeheartedly that um, the growth is, is going to happen on the, the west side of the, of the town. I mean, look at the lots for sale and the built and the land for sale and all of that, you know, is happening over there. I know you make a lot of calls in Northeast Harbor, but probably 99% of them are, are fire alarm calls in the buildings and not an actual fire. I think there were 200 of them last year, weren't there? It were just false alarm calls. So I, I disagree in the sense that you think 
this all ought to be based in Northeast Harbor and it was important to do that. I still think looking, trying to look down the road five and 10 years, where's our growth going to be in the town of Mount Desert? It's gonna be there because in Northeast Harbor, we don't have any land. And what land that um, the 365 bought up, they've openly said that they can't afford to build anything on it. It's under $400,000. So it's not gonna do anything for affordable housing. I'm just really worried about, as a town, you know, I've lived here since 1947. So we tend to jump into things and then, and then we look down the road and when we get down the road, we look back and go, geez, I wish we hadn't done that. And I just don't wanna be, gee, I wish we hadn't done that situation with this because you're talking about an enormous amount of money. Look at the north, the, the village improvement, whatever it was, the beautification of the of the village. I don't know how much money's been spent, but we've got a wider sidewalk. We have three huge metal uh, poles put in. We have um, very conveniently a wading pool, both in front of the of the the uh, post office when it rains. Actually, it's in the spot where. Uh, housing for, I mean, uh, parking for restricted parking is, or in front of Kimball Lane or whatever it is, we just have this water, the street is terrible in, in, in the village. And I don't know how much money we spent, but this is a good example of doing things and getting ahead of ourselves. So I'm, I'm just, now that the, the ambulance service is part of it, I think it needs a whole rethink I think it needs a real good study and I don't want to waste $300,000 or less on something that we may not do. That's my concern. I think we're ahead of, I think you're putting a cart a little bit of the head of the horse here. So that's, that's my only comment on it. And I'll, I'll not comment any further. Mike, it's my understanding that the engineering study itself is divided into some phases. Is that correct? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, the engineering study, actually, it, it's uh, what we're asking uh, money for is to have um, design services um, through bidding. So what we're asking our the design team to do is design the building, um, get all the permits together, um, have everything ready so we can send it out to bid um, to get actual uh, building prices on that so there's really not any phases to it um, i guess yeah i was thinking of your memo to the warren committee where you uh described different phases in the project and so the design phase as opposed to the bid phase or the permitting the design phase is the one that the engineering is devoted to um yeah, I, I guess I, I, I'm not really clear on your question, but um, what what the proposal is is just to hire these people to design again to design the building and have everything ready to send out to bid. So, in the town meeting of 2022, we can ask we can actually come to the town voters and say this is how much it's going to cost to do this uh, building in Northeast Harbor, and will you approve the the funding for it? Okay, thank you. Sure. So I guess while we're waiting, I'll, I'll maybe address some of uh, John's comments, if that's all right. Um, Absolutely. Um, you know, I don't think we have the luxury of, of time, John. Um, and Well, we may, but um, my feeling and my outlook is that, and I can't tell you exactly when it's going to happen, but in a few years, you're going to have um, a staffing issue in the fire department and, and EMS. Um, well, obviously we know the ambulance service is not gonna be around after 2023. So something's gonna have to be done there. Um, now, you know, if the voters wanna wait and or if the voters don't wanna do this project, uh, that's fine with me. You know, I'm, I'm giving you my best scenario, my best solutions um, to continue your fire and EMS service for the town. And uh, so when you call somebody at 1 a.m. or 2 a.m., you know, you're going to expect somebody to show up at your door. If, 
you know, the town doesn't want that, then then that's fine. I understand that. And, and you know, we'll do the best we can with, with the resources we have. Um, but I can probably guarantee you that in a few short years, there are going to be some times where somebody's going to be calling an ambulance or somebody's going to be calling for a fire truck. And uh, you're going to have to wait either a long time to get one from another town, um, or you may not have a fire truck show up at all. Um, so, you know, but it's up, it, obviously it's up to the voters for that. And if that's the way they choose to go, then, you know, we'll do the best we can with the, with the staff that we can um, until, you know, something happens and something's forced to, to happen or, you know, uh, uh, to solve the situation. Well, the primary problem is housing, right? And finding people to come here and work. Yeah, and providing housing for them. So I'm just saying maybe we ought to look harder at trying to find a housing solution without spending probably five million dollars. So that's my only concern. I'm, I'm, as I said, I've owned my own companies. I've had to build my own companies, and so I've had to be practical in everything that I did and common sense about it. So I'm just asking for a little time here. Um, to maybe see if we can find another way that wouldn't cost all that amount of money. That's really my concern, Mike. I, I'm not objecting to the work that you've done and the way you've laid it out. It's just, and what happens in town meetings is we fight over something that's $400 and then something that's two and a half million dollars. We just, our eyes glaze over and we just go, go ahead with it. I mean, it's always been that way. So I'm just trying to prevent some of that. Sure. Yeah, no, I can understand. And I, you know, I kind of, I'll have to agree with you that the housing can and has contributed to, um, you know, our lack of, uh, well, in my opinion, our lack of volunteers that are available for the ambulance and the, and the fire department. Um, but that's something the fire chief can't solve. I mean, that, absolutely. And, I agree. And, and, and that's, and that's a bigger picture. And that, you know, and I'll be honest with you, that's probably something that should have been looked into 15, 20 years ago. Um, oh, I, we tried back in the eighties and got nowhere. Yeah, um, but it, it certainly is a problem. I mean, we're seeing more and more buildings turn into uh, seasonal housing, uh, rentals. And the right. other issue too is, is the people that are moving in their community are not really community minded. The people that are outgoing and go out and you know volunteer their services. Um, and unfortunately they may not be uh, the best uh, candidates to uh, be a firefighter or an EMT. So uh, I would be one of those. <laughs> at my age well great well thank you very much for that exchange too kathy miller has uh, her uh, hand up okay thank you jeff i couldn't see that but and kathy, carrie sands after that good okay. thank you uh yes since um since representing mount desert 365 and since john mentioned us earlier we have bought land we have not given up hope on putting housing in there and in the places along Main Street to have apartments as well. Yes, the cost of construction is exorbitant and has only gone up since we got some very high bids when we did go out to bid on a couple of houses. And it is well beyond the reach of average income people. Uh, but we have not given up hope. We're looking for other models that we might put in there that will be affordable. So I don't want any rumors to get out or any misinformation that we bought this land and we're not going to do anything with it. We're still moving ahead with plans, but uh, it, it is expensive and we're trying to find some reasonable and more affordable options. So thank you, Kathy. Thank you. And uh, Carrie, did you have a question or comment? Yes, thank you. I am newish in town and I'm furiously scrolling through the draft warrant trying to locate this 2.5 million number that has been thrown around because I'm understanding that this conversation is more about 300,000 ish for an engineering study to look at plans for a future potential building do I have that correct and where's the 2.5 million number coming from? Just so I can get caught up and see where the data is coming from. Thank you. Mike, can you respond to that? Yeah, certainly. Um, no, you're correct. The the, uh, the Warren article that we're discussing is for $357,500. The 2.1, 2.5, um, and it's kind of crept up to three, but uh, the figure that you hear kicking around is the initial estimate for the addition to the Northeast Harbor Fire Station. 
Um, but I have to be careful that uh, to make sure everybody realizes that this is a concept estimate. So it's it's a real rough estimate. It's just based on the square footage that we're asking to add and what uh, the current cost of that square footage is for construction of that type of building today. And, and I saw in your email that you had maybe based that by looking at some recent um, projects in other towns in Maine, like Farmingdale and Orrington, Scarborough, et cetera. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Certainly, you're welcome. And I think somebody else had a question as well. Let's see. Uh, Wendy. I think Wendy does. Okay. Wendy, you're on mute. Okay, here we go. So I just wanted to kind of, um, you know, John, I, you know, this whole fiscally responsible thing has is, is been a thorn, you know, I think in all of our sides through this process. Um, and I know, you know, we have had discussions and, and even back, way back when we sort of said to Mike, hey, come up with some plans to figure it out. Um, and I agree, you know, I still do have some of those fiscally responsible, you know, concerns. But when you hear, um, you know, statements from Mike that I think are really real about, you know, that down the road, there might not be that ambulance person available in those few minutes and, and you know, and we may not be able to attract the, the right people. And I think this, I mean, it's interesting. I, I you know, I, I, your comment about if we're talking about $400, everybody has a problem. And this is pure example of that when this meeting, I mean, our, as a select person, like my hope was to get some, you know, real, um, you know, comments and concerns and have some good questions and conversation about this and see where the voters um, felt about this Warren article. But as you look around, you know, most of the people on this meeting come to regular select board meetings and they've been here through the process and heard us. So, um, you know, I agree, we need to be fiscally responsible. And unfortunately, everything costs money, including these, these studies. And, you know, I think Mike's you know, and it has done a great job sort of coming back to the planning board and coming back and coming back with, with other ideas. But, um, you know, those statements that he makes that I think are really real is what kind of hits home as far as where we need to go with this. Thank you, Wendy. This is Jeff Wood. I, I would add, we, we, as a select board, and I don't know about the warrant committee. I don't know how I've been to a lot of those meetings, but we we put Mike through the through the ringer really quite a, quite a lot. And I before I came on the board too, I think he's been making the argument that we need a full time fire department. We need to be forward thinking, and and you know I think that uh, we we did continually ask him to you know try again, try again. This isn't working. This is too much. This is too to I, whatever and then I mean he was making those arguments prior to the ambulances services announcement of, of, of the change in that um, I think that that I mean I guess my 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 feeling at this point is I was not easily convinced um, but at this point all the challenges we posed to him and and all the the diligence that he and, and Basil and, and um, working with Jim Willis as well um, it, it, to come to the the hope of the this vision for the for the um, for the fire and EMS service is one that that I I support and uh, I too worry about all the things that you talk about the financial situation and the housing situation I work in the field of education and that is one of the biggest challenges we face in the schools right now is getting teachers because they can't live here they can't afford to live here and uh, Anyway, so I just wanted to put my my two cents on that that I was not easily convinced and and but I'm in support of this um, at least moving forward, seeing what what it will cost and trying to make it work. Thank you, Brian Henkel has his hand up. Okay, Brian, thank you, Jeff. I'm having trouble seeing the different people, but so Brian. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think guess uh, the, fir the first thing is that you, I think that Chief Bender has done a really good job in looking at the situation, 
trying to come up with some sort of reasonable plan for going forward and assessing what are the needs for the town. I think that there could, have, there could be some assistance in that process in terms of either hiring a consultant or finding a way to have somebody come in who can do a study that can support what Chief Bender is seeing. I think he's seeing the reality of the situation, but that there could be some support um, by hiring a professional to, to uh, study where are the calls going, how far are they, how often are they happening, what is the requirement overnight to, to, to support this idea that we need 24 hour. I, I don't doubt Chief Bender's um, conclusions on this at all. I think that it, there could be some some further support by having a study that that that's done to to assist in in setting a path forward. I think the path forward that we have actually probably is right though with putting in full time twenty four hour um, fire, and I think that the price tag for it, while you know that sounds like a very high number in today's world. And in today's numbers, I don't think it's that astronomically high. This is just the reality of the world that we currently live in, is that these kinds of things are very expensive. We're shifting from, you know, a volunteer system with a few full-time employees and non-24-hour service to 24-hour service and more dedicated numbers. That, that's not a cheap jump, unfortunately. That that's going to be expensive to make that kind of a jump. And that's an expense that I think is worthwhile. I believe that Chief Bender has understood the situation. Um, so uh, yeah, I, 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 think it, I think it's a good move forward. I think it's a difficult thing. And I would like to be able to have a better way to address lots of community concerns about why this money is being spent. And I think, the chief has done a great job of doing that. I think he could, there could have been further support in that, in that role of being the defender for why we need this. Thank you. Bill, could I ask a question? Oh, absolutely. Not. Yeah, yes. Well, I just, I would agree with much of what Brian just said. It's, you can sort of lay it out um, the way Mike has uh, time and time again, but sometimes you need that sort of reinforcement. And one thing um, that I don't know whether it was you, Mike, or maybe Basil, uh, that map that you had with all the little pinpoint dots all over it, where every call had been over the past year, um, I just think supportive documents like that, um, if we could make those available um, or even fine tune them a little bit might be uh, helpful because it, it just that visual really allows people to see how spread out the calls are and how they really are sort of on a 50-50 nature Northeast Harbor and the, the Somesville, Hull Quarry, Pretty Marsh area. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, Matt, we can, um, we actually probably should clean those maps up a little bit, and make them you know more understandable. But uh, yeah, we can do that and maybe uh, post them on the town website for people to see. Or yeah, I think it might be helpful. Yeah, well, that's you know, and and again, this is how these are. This is how the conclusion. This is how I came to these conclusions. Is it's it's we try to be data driven, you know, and and when we look at the number of calls, that's where we try to figure out the best locations, uh, you know, for your, uh, for your staff and your stations and your trucks and stuff like that. We just don't randomly, you know, um, pick spots on the map and say, this is a good place for a fire station. So, you know, I think it's helpful to have that information out there so people can actually see where the calls are. Um, I think it'd be good also to see if it's actually a fire call or a false alarm. And, and by the way, Speaking of the false alarm part, you know, where you come out and it's just something wrong with their system in their house. Do we charge them for, I know we don't for a first call, but I think we ought to have something if it happens two and three times to the same location that they ought to be charged for. It. I mean, it take, you got to bring equipment out. You got to rush to see if it's a fire and then, you know, no, it's just an alarm system. 
there ought to be some kind of mechanism, I think, to, to make some revenue off that. So it's a tremendous waste of time for you guys. Um, and let them figure out how to get their own systems working better. I thought we did decide to charge for false alarms. No, we have not. Um, the board asked me to look into that, um, I guess on about eight, 10 years ago. And so we did some studies, um, both for fire and uh, burglar alarms. And um, after we looked at about two years worth of calls, um, we realized that even though we have a high amount of false alarms in town, both for burglary and, uh, and fire, um, when it came down to locations, there was only, within two years, there was only maybe four or five uh, buildings that had multiple false alarms. Most of the alarms are at least one or like a one time or maybe twice a year occurrence. So by the time you put in all the work of registering all the fire alarms in Northeast Harbor and having contacts and building addresses and stuff like that, uh, just for a few hundred dollars, it just didn't seem um, you know, worthwhile to, to pursue that uh, charging for false alarms. Most communities do not charge for the first one anyway. Um, I mean, if this community wants to, that's fine. That's up to the, to the elected officials. But um, so you'd only charge either after the second or third alarm. And, you know, about responding to false alarms, we respond to every call like it's a real emergency. Um, I've instructed our staff to do that, to treat every call as a real emergency until they get on scene and determine that there's no life, property, or uh, environmental hazards there. Um, if we start treating false, like all the calls or, or suspected false alarms as false alarms, that's when complacency starts setting in, and that's when you get yourself in real trouble. Um, so, you know, I, I guess I would advise uh, against that, but, you know, again, that's not my decision. It's, it's above my above my pay grade. Great, thank you. See Jerry Miller has his hand up. Okay, good, Jerry. Uh, the other part of false alarms is half the time, the false alarms are not caused by kids pranking the alarms or anything. They're caused by technical glitches in the alarm systems that people put in there that are increasingly more elaborate than they need to be. Um, when I was on the board of Neighbor House years and years and years ago, we put in an alarm system for the gym that went off once a week. Um, not through our fault, not through anybody messing with it, but once a week I got to drive in from Zomesville to let everybody in to make sure that the alarm was working again and it was a glitch and not anybody's particular fault except maybe the alarm companies, but... Um, so it's something that, you know, I doubt there are many malicious false alarms that you've dealt with, are there? No, no, that's that's very rare. Most of your false alarms are either uh, equipment related, like you said, technical. Um, a lot of them are contractor initiated. Uh, people going into houses and starting work without properly covering the alarms. And a majority of them too are people that probably shouldn't be having fires in the fireplaces, but elected to do so and fill the house up with smoke. Um, yeah, so. Kyle. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment to John's uh, point that uh, we should be charging for these false alarms when a lot of these properties that do have the false alarms have a fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollar tax bill that they're paying every year. So I would like to think they have paid for those calls in their property tax bill. That's kind of the point of having a tax bill. You got Brian's hand up again. Okay, Brian. Thank you, Jeff. I I think we've probably, you know spend enough time on false alarms. I don't think that the need for 24 hour service is being driven by a misunderstanding about the number of false alarms on Chief Bender's part. So I, I appreciate the conversation that people wanna have, you know, <laughs> fewer false alarms if at all possible, but I also, I don't, I, did, I think we're a little off topic on this. Just 
This is Basil. You mind if I say something real quick? Sure. Um, Basil from the ambulance service. Just so everybody knows, too, um, the uh, ambulance service is actually already staffing people 24 7 um, just because of. Sorry, the radio here is making noise. Um, just because we have, we're having such a hard time, you know, getting staff, you know, reliably to respond from home using the kind of traditional volunteer fire department model um, that we've already transitioned to that. And we started um, at the beginning of the pandemic having a full crew on. Um, and so a lot of this planning for having staffing in the stations 24 seven really is already happening. It's just, we're having to do it in kind of a hodgepodge fashion. We've got people scattered all over to do it. And Mike's plan would allow these folks to just, you know, be at the station and, you know, would allow a faster response time. Cause like he says, you know, if I have somebody here at the medical center or wherever they are, and there's a snowstorm or something like that, they do have to, you know, you know, get their car, get in their car and figure out how to clean it off, things like that. Um, and I mean, while it seems foolish, it is something you have to deal with. Um, and I mean, unfortunately, I think this is Mike's got it, or fortunately, or whatever. I mean, Mike's got a good plan, and I really think this is a you know a good option for the town. And it's unfortunate that it costs a lot of money because I'm a taxpayer too, and I just assume not spend a lot of money. But I think this is where we need to go. Unfortunately. Thank you. Well, we're about uh, 45 plus minutes into this, and I don't know if people are feeling that uh, we're getting to the point where we might want to wrap up for tonight. And if you do feel that way, then I'd certainly invite people if they wanted to make any kind of summary statement as to what they feel that they've, they're hearing or, or what they would uh, uh, like to see us focus on when we think about this a week from today. I just like to um, thank Bill for for organizing this and, and putting it together and Mike for your answers in advance. I think the reason we're not getting a lot of questions is you've answered all of them and very well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Anybody else or Chief, do you want the last word? No, I probably said enough already. <laughs> no, I, I, I just, you know, again, I, I heard somebody say we wish there was a lot more people here, and I, I did too. You know, I thought there would be more interest and uh, more questions, and, and more people just wanted to know what was going on. Um, but um, no, I, you know, again, I'll just reiterate: it's up to the voters if, if uh, people don't want this uh, or they want to wait. You know, um, it would probably be wise to vote this down next Tuesday because there's not much sense uh, spending three hundred and fifty thousand dollars on a study that uh, you're not going to pursue or thinking about doing five or ten years from now. Uh, but just be prepared for the consequences if you do. I, you know, I can't guarantee what the future lies for the for the fire service, at least for our department, as far as staffing goes. Um, but, you know, um, whatever uh, hand we're dealt, we'll do the best we can, you know, for the for the citizens and the community. And um, as always, I just appreciate all the support that everybody's given us over the past uh, few months, the past years. Um, and I'm speaking for the entire department, you know, on that too. So thank you. Well, thank you. Derlin, any last words? Well, I share that I wish that we had more people, but I thought the discussion was excellent. And I thought that these are the type of questions that we probably will get to uh, to see next week at, uh, at town meeting. So I think Mike's done a very good job preparing for them. I think the select board has done a very good job of preparing Mike uh, for this uh, through their questions and through their concerns and over the past year or two. So so I'm very pleased. I think we I think we have a... We have a sound plan. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. But I think the, the consequences of delay are certainly more fearsome than the uh, consequences of, uh, of pushing forward. So 
Uh, I just hope we have a good discussion and the people will decide. And uh, I can assure you that we'll all do like Mike says, we'll do our best. We'll take the results of the town meeting, learn from them and we'll go forward and, uh, and, uh, and continue on uh, to the next one. So again, thanks everyone for showing up here tonight. Much appreciated. Well, thank you, Darlin, for your role in organizing this. Well, if no one has anything else to say, then I guess, uh, Kyle, we're, we're done. We don't need a motion to adjourn? No. Yeah. I just push the end button. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Bill. Thanks. All right.